Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to get started. I think some other practitioners are going to join this session as we get started. But uh, I've got a lot to cover, so I want to get going. This is uh, webinar number seven in the series, the Pioneers of Healthy Lifespan Longevity Series. Uh, this month, we're featuring the work of Dr. Kenneth Cooper, one of my personal heroes. He is the father or the founder of the aerobic movement, and uh, I want to talk a lot about uh, his life's work. It's very, very impressive. So uh, Kenneth Cooper was born in 1931. Uh, he uh, completed his Bachelor of Science degree, then a Doctor of Medicine at the University of Oklahoma, went on to do a Master's in Public Health at Harvard University. Shortly after graduation, he became an Air Force doctor at age 26, spent 13 years providing military service in that capacity trained astronauts. Uh, he was a very, very influential character uh, as part of the his military service. During his military service, he devised what's called the simple Cooper test, which looks at uh, your aerobic fitness level. And it can be in his 12 minute run walk um, max exercise test uh, can establish very closely what your VO2 max is. So he was able to, to show that his 12-minute max run-walk test correlated very well to somebody being on a treadmill, having a maximum stress test with 12 lead electrocardiograms that basically he could predict what your VO2 max is just from his simple field test, which is still used by the military and many other organizations today. So it's important to understand what VO2 max is all about. So your VO2 max is how much oxygen and your tissues, particularly your muscles, extract from the bloodstream at any given time and use it in aerobic pathways to generate energy. So it's measured in milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And so the more oxygen you can uh, uh, utilize, extract from the bloodstream and utilize, especially in your muscle tissues, the more energy you can produce and so your performance improves so if you know if your vo2 max is very low you can maybe walk a mile in 20 minutes but if your vo2 max is much better then you can walk a mile in 12 minutes because you can generate more energy and so your performance improves so your vo2 max is really largely dependent on the ability of your muscles to extract oxygen from the bloodstream and use it in aerobic pathways in the mitochondria to generate atp and when you do aerobic exercise repeatedly on a regular basis, you actually increase the number of mitochondria in your muscles. So you have a greater number of energy factories that can now use that oxygen to help generate more energy. So the more mitochondria you have, that your you can flow more electrons can flow down the cytochrome chain, produce more ATP. So you have better performance. You can you can walk faster, run faster, cycle faster, swim faster. You can you can canoe faster. Whatever you're doing, you can that's aerobic. You can do it faster. But at the end, as the hydrogens come down the electron chain, remember they combine with oxygen to form water. That's why the oxygen is important. If you can't get oxygen to the muscle tissue then the, the rate at which the hydrogen electrons can come down the mitochondrial chain is inhibited, so you can't make as much energy. So oxygen utilization becomes very important, or oxygen consumption. So the, the, the more mitochondria you have, the larger the mitochondria, the, the better your oxygen uptake by your muscles, and you can produce more ATP. So over a 12-minute test, if I say I want you to run or walk as fast as you can for the next 12 minutes, if you're generating more ATP energy because you can get more oxygen into your muscles, then your distance will be greater than someone who doesn't have that same capacity. So aerobic training, if you do it regularly, increases your VO2 max. Your muscles extract more oxygen from the bloodstream more effectively. You can produce more energy. Your performance improves. So you can watch yourself actually improve your VO2 max over time as a rule. So you remember that as an example, when you're burning uh, carbohydrates, uh, as glucose burns down the pyruvic acid, that's that's anaerobic metabolism. You make some ATP there, but not very much. And then the pyruvic acid then will diffuse sort of into the mito into the um, mitochondria, where it's converted to pi to uh, uh, to acetyl coenzyme A, and it combines with oxaloacetate to form citrate. Then these intermediates in the Krebs cycle, as they're going around. 
NAD and FAD are grabbing the hydrogen electrons and shuttling, shuttling those hydrogen electrons down the electron transfer chain. And that's really how you end up making ATP energy. But you need oxygen at the end of that chain in order to make water. So the, the ability to extract oxygen from the bloodstream is a major factor in how much energy you can produce during this, uh, this, this aerobic pathway. But as more electrons flow down the electron transfer chain, uh, two to five percent of those electrons actually leak out of the membrane and they combine with oxygen in the cytosol of the cell and it generates more free radicals. So you're making more energy, but you're also generating more free radicals like the superoxide anion and hydrogen peroxide and hydroxy radicals. 90% of all the free radicals in the cell are made from electrons leaking out of the mitochondria chain. In his later years, Dr. Kenneth Cooper said, you know what, these free radicals, when you do more aerobic exercise, you're actually creating a lot of damage to yourself, even though you're improving your cardiovascular fitness, there's a lot of damage being caused by these free radicals, and they need to be quenched by antioxidants. So he wrote a book called The Antioxidant Revolution, which I will show you shortly. So Cooper continued his work with the Air Force and with NASA, developing programs for astronauts and aerospace centers. But at age 29, he uh, was water skiing. He had terrible chest pain. He thought he was having a heart attack. Went to the hospital and they said, no, you, you're just simply out of shape. He had gained 40 pounds due to being so inactive during medical school. So he said, I'm going to get myself into shape. So he started running and got himself into shape, ran his first marathon about a year later. And to continue to do uh, uh, create programs that were conditioning programs for astronauts and and uh, other people related to NASA and the military. A lot after studying thousands and thousands of military individuals, he developed the twelve minute Cooper test and the one point five mile fitness test. And so this is all got explained in his book called Aerobics. So in 1968, the results of what happens when you do aerobic exercise, he was the first one to identify. It. So he wrote a book called Aerobics in 1968, which went on to become a bestseller. And he actually coined the term aerobics. And we talk about aerobics today like common vocabulary. It was Kenneth Cooper who actually coined that term to describe that type of exercise. So that book went on to be a huge bestseller, published in different languages. But subsequent to that, he wrote another 18 books over his lifetime. In 1970, he resigned from the military and founded the Cooper Aerobic Center in Dallas. When you land in the Dallas airport and you're now driving into the Dallas city center, off to your right-hand side on the highway, you see the Aerobics Cooper Center. It's a huge building and it's really world-renowned. So... Uh, he, in 2021, turned 90 years old, and in his later years, he actually promoted some new ideas about exercise and supplements that haven't really received the same level of media coverage and widespread acceptance. But I think the message is very important, which I'm going to share with you today. At age, at age 89, uh, he he'd covered 38,000 miles of running and walking. He still walks uh, uh, every day, two to three miles in less than 20 minutes a mile. And so today he would be 92 years old as of 2023. So the outline of this presentation, uh, sort of building on his work, will we'll sort of define aerobic exercise, look at the benefits, uh, look at the Cooper test in a little more detail, how to interpret the, uh, interpret the results. We'll look at risks of overtraining and what is the sweet spot for longevity in terms of aerobic activity and some precautions and concerns about aerobic exercise and what nutritional considerations we should be advising our patients to employ if they're gonna be uh, involved in aerobic activity. So these are sort of the kinds of charts you see in fitness centers, right? So you see that your maximum attainable heart rate as you get older declines. So you can predict your maximum attainable heart rate by taking the number 220 and subtracting your age. When you're exercising between 60 and 90% of your uh, maximum attainable heart rate in heartbeats per minute, you're in the aerobic training zone. That's where all the magic starts to happen. So when you go into fitness clubs, you see charts like this on the wall. 
showing that even at 50% of your maximum table heart rate, you're starting to get some aerobic benefit. But most people just naturally, if they're riding a bike or they're running, walking on a treadmill using the elliptical machine, will find themselves very comfortable at about 70 to 75% of their maximum attainable heart rate. Once you get above 90% of your maximum attainable heart rate, you're now, you're in that, you've crossed into the anaerobic threshold. That's when the oxygen demand uh, supply can't keep up with the demand. So now you're burning carbohydrates more anaerobically and you're building up more lactic acid and it becomes more high intensity training. So people who do interval training are sometimes pushing themselves into that zone and then they come back down into the submax zone. So you see charts that often look like this. This is another example showing that here's light to moderate activity and then, uh, you know, more this would be sort of the standard aerobic zone where most people are comfortable. And then this is when you start pushing it a little bit more. But as you get older, because your maximum attainable heart rate declines, it's just a function of aging. You tend to, for aerobic exercise to be effective, you want to work out roughly at 65 to 85% of your maximum attainable heart rate. That'll put you right in the aerobic zone. So what happens when you do that? You get benefits. Well, there are peripheral benefits. You start to increase the number and size of the mitochondria. Your muscles start to increase the number of mitochondria and the size in your slow twitch aerobic muscle fibers. And that allows you to start generating more energy per second. And you, now your performance improves. You also generate, it starts to, uh, producing more oxidative enzymes to burn fat more effectively. You increase your oxygen consumption, which is very, very it's very helpful for your heart, as we're going to see. You increase your fat burning capacity and the muscles increase their amount of myoglobin so they can transfer iron, iron more effectively to help improve with oxidative metabolism. The muscles will store more carbohydrates. So now less carbohydrate gets converted into fat in your liver because your muscles double the size of their glycogen fuel tank. And the muscles also increase their, the amount of fat that they store so that when the exercise begins, they have an instant source of fat. So you don't have to deplete glycogen from the liver as quickly, which helps to improve overall aerobic performance. And of course, on the fat burning end, what really happens is when you get into the aerobic training zone, as opposed to just walking leisurely through a mall, you know, you're not in your aerobic training zone. So, is it, so does, it, does it really matter? I'm burning the same number of calories. It matters from this standpoint. If I get into my aerobic training zone because I push the intensity up a little bit, that's when adrenaline is released. It comes down to my fat cells, stimulates the beta uh, receptors uh, on my fat cell, which is going to then um, release fat to come out of my fat cells and circulate through the bloodstream so my muscles can burn fat. So here's a, a, a fat cell, the adrenaline or epinephrine secreted during aerobic exercise now releases, uh, hydrolyzes the triglycerides into glycerol and free fatty acids. When the free fatty acids come out into the bloodstream, they get attached to albumin. And as they travel by the muscles or exercise, let's say you're on a stationary bike, the, the exercising muscles will pick the fat out of the bloodstream and burn the fat and your fat cells get a little smaller. So aerobic exercise helps to burn body fat because it releases the fat into the bloodstream so your muscles can burn it. But that usually takes about five to eight minutes into the exercise. By the time the fat is released, gets into the bloodstream and gets to your muscle, you don't really start burning fat effectively till about five minutes in. Then there are the central adaptations that help to reduce risk of cardiovascular disease. So as you become more aerobically fit, you develop an athlete's pulse. You have a slower resting heart rate. And the reason that that's good is because when your heart is contracting, it's pumping blood out to the periphery of the body. But during the, the phase when it's relaxing, that diastolic filling stage is when blood gets circulated through the coronary vessels of the heart muscle itself. That's when the myocardial cells get access to oxygen. If you're really unfit and you have a rapid heartbeat because your tissues can't extract oxygen very well, so the heart has to pump even more oxygen to your tissues, then it, there's not a long time between heartbeats to fill the coronary blood vessels. And that's when you get into trouble with arrhythmias and leading to atrial fibrillation and uh, coronary events. Also, if you're under age 60, if you're doing aerobic exercise, the heart forms new blood vessels to, put to, to send even more oxygen-rich blood to the heart muscle. Also, when you're doing aerobic exercise, it helps the, the heart sort of adapt to any sudden type of stress, any kind of stressful event, which would normally raise your heart rate and could trigger atrial fibrillation. Your heart is more desensitized to that because it's used to having the release of adrenaline on a regular basis.
from the aerobic exercise. Also, the heart contracts with a greater amount of force. It can pump more blood with each heartbeat. So now it can take more time to fill between heartbeats and you get that athlete's pulse effect, which is very good for sending blood to the coronary blood vessels. You're also getting improved insulin sensitivity. So your glucose levels go down. When insulin levels are lower, which is great, you don't resorb as much sodium from the kidneys. So blood pressure goes down. You don't sugarcoat your, your hemoglobin as much. So you don't end up with gly glycolated uh, proteins that are linked to heart disease and inflammatory disease that lead to heart disease. And aerobic exercise helps a lot of people keep their blood pressure down. So there's all these great adaptations from aerobic exercise. It was Kenneth Cooper's original work that showed a lot of these benefits. And of course, in recent years, we've seen that aerobic exercise helps to improve brain cognition and decrease uh, sort of mental decline uh, in aging. And so here's a, uh, just one paper on that that you can read. I'll send you all these slides so you can drill down deeper and look at some of these things yourself. Also, aerobic exercise upregulates the sirtuin longevity genes that we have in our cells. So as an example, when you, when you stimulate the sirtuin-1 gene, it acts like an epigenetic switch on many other genes that are related to the prevention of cancer and diabetes and uh, neurodegenerative disease, helps to support immunity, increases the production of endogenous antioxidant enzymes. So you want the sirtuin genes to be activated. One of the main ways to do that is through regular aerobic exercise. It's not the only way. There's other things that will stimulate the sirtuin genes like intermittent fasting and dietary restriction, but moderate uh, aerobic exercise can do that. Metformin, that, the, that drug can do that. Certain uh, uh, types of polyphenols can do it that are in the diet in certain supplements. Some supplements that uh, Diva makes, in fact, melatonin does that. But the sirtuin enzymes are all require the B vitamin niacin in the form of NAD to, to, in order to be functional as sirtuin enzymes. So this whole subject of sirtuin longevity genes and longevity, that's a whole other seminar unto itself, which I'll be happy to teach you at some point down the road. But Kenneth Cooper, following thousands of military personnel, developed the 12 minute Cooper test, which is how far can you run in 12 minutes? What's the maximum distance you can cover? And once you know what that is, it correlate, you, it, you look at his tables that he has, and it'll show you exactly what your VO2 max is. And so where you stand, are you in the poor category, the good category, very good, are you in the excellent category for your age group? So it's a phenomenal field test that can be applied to large numbers of people at one time, but you can also do it on yourself to track your own progress over time if you are doing aerobic training. So these are ways that you actually calculate it. If you know the distance you, you travel in 12 minutes in kilometers, you plug it into the equation, it'll give you your VO2 max. If you know, if you do it in miles, it'll, here's the equation for miles. Or you can use the online calculator, which, which they have available. Now just go to that website, plug your numbers in, it'll show you what your VO2 max is. So what you see is that for females and males, the numbers are different because women have, less muscle tissue than men. So women are never going to be able to extract as much oxygen from the bloodstream into their muscle tissues as men can, because men have a greater number of muscle fibers to do that. So that so the values for women and men are slightly different. But if I use myself as an example, what you'll see here is that when I was 19 years old, if my VO2 max was, was 35 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute, that'd be very poor. But now that I'm almost 70, that same value of 35 would put me in a good category. And you say, well, that's so weird. But it's but so let me explain this to you. When I was 35 years old, I could run three miles in about 21 minutes, maximum 22 minutes on a bad day. Now that I'm approaching 70, it I'm now instead of running seven minute miles, I'm running 10 minute miles. But for someone almost 70 years old, running 10 minute miles is actually pretty good. So it's it's relative to your age because as you get older, as your maximum heart rate declines as a function of aging, your your aerobic capacity decreases, and you can never be the same athlete that you were at 19 years old, even if you keep training. 
So if you know how many meters you covered, here's another chart that will show you that. What's really phenomenal, in my view, is looking at world-class athletes who are in their 20s. So here are the males down here, the females. Are, look at the cross-country the cross skiers at the Olympics who are like in their 20s, for instance. VO2 maxes of like over 80 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute. It's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, we have long distance runners and speed skaters and cyclists, all these aerobic type events. Then you get to this sedentary slug who's doing nothing, but they're 20 years old. They still have a VO2 max that's better than I have at age 70, even though I do aerobic activity. So just the, 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 the youth factors alone is quite in, in, important. But as you get older, it becomes very, very important to try to maintain your aerobic capacity as best you can. You notice that the, the, the women uh, cross-country skiers have an incredible VO2 max as well, but men are always going to be higher simply because they have a greater mu number of muscle fibers. So men and women can never really compete in these sports on the same level just due to the simple fact that men have a greater number of muscle fibers. It gives them an unfair advantage. But then when you track uh, lifelong endurance athletes who were spectacular in their 20s, their VO2 max declines as they get older the same way that mine is declining. But you want to try to preserve it as best you can to maintain those uh, cardiovascular benefits. So now the World Journal of Cardiology in 2017 said, where do we stand with all this exercise in cardiovascular health, looking at aerobic and anaerobic activity? They said, you know, about 250,000 people die each year in the United States just because they're physically inactive, because their aerobic capacity is so poor. The VO2 max is so poor, and it accounts for 30% of ischemic heart disease. It's an important risk factor for cardiovascular events, not being reasonably aerobically fit. So in 1996, the American Heart Association said, listen, we've got to publish some recommendations about this. So they said, based on age group, we're saying pe people five to 17 years old should do at least 60 minutes of moderate activity every single day. And for the most part, most people I know in that age group don't do that. 18 to 64 year olds should be getting 150 uh, minutes of moderate activity, moderate aerobic activity uh, every week, or at least or 75 minutes of vigorous activity throughout the week. That would get you into a decent aerobic uh, area of fitness without overtraining and weakening yourself. At age 65 and beyond, you do the same thing, but you also want to do some things to maintain balance so you don't fall and have a fracture. These things all make really good sense to me when, when I show you the rest of the evidence. The same there's other benefits that when you do this, your, your VO2 max improves. People who have, are heart attack survivors, it helps them improve their heart function over time. It also increases your HDL, the good cholesterol, by about 9%. There's all these reasons to be aerobically fit over your lifetime. The question is, what is the dose and the timing that gives you the best shot for longevity? They also go on to say anaerobic exercise is also doing some weight training, for instance, also is synergistic to the cardiovascular benefits of aerobic activity because you're getting it's anti-fibrotic, it's, it's anti-proliferative on the left ventricle, so you don't get fibrosis, that actually strength training is also important. Um, and so there, you, I suggest you read that paper uh, published in 2017 if you have a chance. So what about longevity studies on people who have been aerobically fit their entire lives? Are they actually living longer? So in 2023 in Runner's World in, in that uh, magazine, they said, look, you know, last year there were two large studies published, one uh, which is the Copenhagen study, which I'll show you shortly, saying that people who run their, throughout their entire lives, it extends their life expectancy by six years. But there's a catch. People who run 15 to 20 miles a week or they do about two two to two and a half hours of aerobic activity of any kind, they get the extra six years. But if you, these athletes are aerobically trained people who are like fitness fanatics who are running 30 miles or more, don't actually live longer. They have the same risk of dying as someone who's sedentary. And they're saying primarily it's because they actually are damaging their hearts, creating heart scarring. So overtraining now is something we're starting to recognize as being kind of risky. So this was also reported by in 2007 by the Breakfast uh, Club findings. There was a this Dr. Ben Rosen, who's an MD. He was an early adopter of aerobic fitness back in 1969. 
They formed a club, uh, I think in Manhattan, 54 members. And he tried, he followed them over their lifetime. He's saying, you know what? Uh, the ones who were runners compared to my, my friends who were just sedentary cohorts, the, my friends and I, we lived 19 years long, longer because we did aerobic activity compared to men of the same uh, sort of uh, cohort. So as he followed these 54 uh, serious runners, some ran more than 100 miles a week. Others were like college athletes that maintained a, a, a very high level of fitness. He said uh, since mid, the mid-1970s, 18 of the 54 members died as of 2007. Among the 36 still alive, 17 had some form of heart disease at, 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 at age 76. Cancer was the biggest cause of death, seven runners at age 77 on average. Heart disease claimed five lives at, for people at age 86. As a group, they realized life extension of 19 years compared to men of that era who were not fit. But none of these men became centenarians. In other words, exercise alone doesn't get you to 100 years of healthy living. If you train too hard, there's a point of diminishing returns where it actually starts to become detrimental to some degree. Same with Tour de France athletes. They, they get an extra eight years of life extension, but they don't get to be 100 years old. So some of the recent studies are showing that with, with aerobic exercise, less is more. So this is the Danish study I was referring to earlier. The title of the, the study is uh, Dose of Jogging and Long-Term Mortality. This is the Copenhagen City Heart Study. What they found, looking at thousands of people, is that people who do aerobic exercise for 1 to 2.4 hours of exercise a week, split up over two to three sessions, have the uh, seems to be the optimal frequency for life extension and health promotion. Anything above that, didn't give you any greater benefit than people who are completely sedentary. So we'll come back to that. There's other precautions about aerobic exercise, and that is when you're doing it, you're also breaking down your muscle tissue. That's why a lot of long distance runners look very thin and frail because they're burning their muscle tissue down as a source of fuel. So someone who's sedentary needs one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. If you're doing moderate aerobic activity, you need 1.5 grams of protein for every kilogram you weigh. And if you're doing what I'm doing, where I'm doing 30 minutes of aerobic activity almost every day, plus an hour of weight training at least five times a week. So I need like 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, not just to maintain my lean mass, but to try to gain lean mass, because as you get older, your body would naturally break it down. So my part of my solution to this is I created the Adiva Lean Mass Plus Shake. So I have three scoops in the morning with water and ice cubes. Gets me my, my first 37 grams of whey protein, high biological source of protein that tastes great. I add two tablespoons of ground flaxseed powder. I add some creatine. I add some L-glutamine. And I add some cocoa powder because all these things working together help to maintain lean mass, keep cholesterol down, support the prostate gland in, in, in women breast tissue, support lean mass in the cocoa powder, help the flavonoids dilate blood vessels to help keep your blood pressure down. So to me, it's like a medicinal drink that I have about five mornings a week. If you haven't tried the Adiva Lean Mass Shake, I'd suggest you try it. It's, it's delicious. I would use it the way that I'm suggesting here. Another concern is that, as Dr. Cooper pointed out, the more aerobic activity you do, the more hydrogens leak out of the mitochondrial chain. They form free radicals. Those free radicals cause muscle inflammation, gene damage that can be linked to cancer and weaken the immune system. In 2012, he was interviewed. You might want to listen to this podcast. He's saying, if you're going to do aerobic activity, you need to get antioxidant supplements, at the very least, vitamin C, beta carotene, and vitamin E at these levels. You want to get 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day, 400 IUs of vitamin E, get your 15,000 I use a beta carotene plus beta carotene from food. And that's really what I put into the Adiva multivitamin and mineral many years ago, those exact dosages. So that, that Adiva multivitamin, if someone's doing aerobic activity, it's the perfect supplement to help keep those free radicals to a minimum. And I'll show you the later research that he did as well. He also said in the interview, something very interesting that if you can walk, 12 minute miles, if you can walk a mile in 12 minutes and you can do two or three miles like that a day, that's as good as jogging two or three uh, miles. He's saying, so people who want to do speed walking, it'll give them the same benefit if they can walk that fast. 
this was his book in 1997 called The Antioxidant Revolution. He's saying it's not it's not just aerobic exercise that's important. You need the antioxidants to go with the program. And I and I believe he's 100% right about that. There's all kinds of references on that. I've given them to you here. The third concern is that when you do aerobic exercise, it weakens your immune system if you overtrain. So as you get older, your immune system gets weaker for a number of reasons, which I've laid out here. Diet and alcohol will weaken your immune system, refined sugars and alcohol. Cannabis does that. But physical activity, light to moderate activity, strengthens your immune system. If you're overtraining, if you're doing too much aerobic activity, then you actually weaken your immunity and you're more prone to infection and cancer, as you're going to see. Smoking weakens the immune system, not enough sleep weakens the immune system, depression, stress, uh, certain nutrients, if your vitamin D levels are too high, certain drugs, certain comorbidity issues. So your immune system gets can get weaker for a number of reasons, but overtraining is one of those reasons to be aware of. So here are references on just how exercise affects the immune system. These are all amazing research papers to look at. But the strategy to help your patients maintain a healthy immune system is to make sure they get enough sleep. They do moderate activity, but they don't overtrain. Stress management, eliminate things that you know are going to weaken the immune system, smoking, alcohol, certain rec recreational drugs. And I would suggest use the Adiba multivitamin and mineral lifelong because you're getting antioxidants and B vitamins and zinc. And also after age 50, a Diva Immuno Detox Prime makes sense because that's when the immune system really starts to become less and less active in the aging process. But we'll we'll get back to that. So Dr. Cooper was interviewed uh, by the by the magazine called Texas Monthly in 1995. He said, I began to have my doubts about doing too much aerobic exercise when my friend, Dr. Jim Fix, died at 52. He was the author of a book called The Complete Book of Running. He had a heart attack while he was jogging. He says, first, at first, I put it down to just, well, he had genetic risk factors. But then more evidence started to show up. Other people that I knew, a, a super fit woman who did aerobics 10 hours a day, dies of a melanoma. Then my friend who's a super athlete, winner of the Ironman competition, dies of a deadly melanoma. Other elite athletes who I knew from the aerobic center and from their world-class fame developed terminal illnesses, brain tumors, prostate cancer, another brain tumor, dead of cancer, testicular cancer, Hodgkin's disease, leukemia. Cooper says, listen, I know of 150 cases like this, including 94 athletes who have prostate cancer who are patients at our clinic at the Cooper Center. He said, the truth is that too much exercise can kill you. There's a sweet spot of activity that you want to try to guide people to. When you go beyond that, it becomes serious. He said, I didn't really understand what was happening, so I did a study on it. I studied almost 14, 000, over 13,000 people who were uh, at our center. And I saw that there was a reverse J curve. And that means people who are really unfit, their risk of dying prematurely is quite high. Then you get the sweet spot. People who are active are getting great health benefits and greater longevity. But then when you go be, when just the exceptionally active people who are really pushing the envelope, all of a sudden you see death rates start to rise again. He said that there's something about distress exercise that actually destroys the body immune system and he's saying what's happening is those free radicals are damaging the immune system in a serious way we've known for a long time that when you do aerobic exercise breath pentane levels are higher and blood levels of tbars which is a, a marker for oxidative stress <laughs> those things rise then those free radicals damage the immune system damage genes in the cells that can lead to cancer also weakening immunity creating inflammation he says the, what you need to do is there's two steps here cut for some people they need to cut back on their exercise if you're running more than 15 miles a week he says you're running for some other reason behind besides health all you need is 15 miles a week he says you can he advises people as they get older to walk two miles in less than 40 minutes five times a week that's what he does himself he runs or walks five or six times a week for a total of 12 to 15 miles the other way to combat free radical damage he says to take antioxidant supplements every single day at the doses that we talked about earlier. He says, I'll tell you that, you know, even though the medical community is, you know, sort of lukewarm about supplements, because most of the medical doctors I know personally take antioxidants at this level because they've seen the research. 
And not only do antioxidant supplements help to quench free radicals, but they also support immune system function directly. So there's all kinds of evidence on that. And L-glutamine does the same thing. So I showed you earlier that I put L-glutamine into my protein shake. And the reason is it does two things. It helps support immune cells. A lot of immune cells use glutamine as a source of energy. And L-glutamine also slows down the breakdown of your muscle tissue when you're exercising. So that's why I use it. So in his in his uh, book, which outlines the eight healthy, as he got older, he published you know a number of different books. And he says, listen, it comes down to these eight, these eight healthy steps that people should use to live longer and live better. Maintain a health. It's not just about aerobic exercise. You need to maintain a healthy weight, make healthy food choices most of the time. And nobody does it perfectly. Exercise most days of the week. Take the right supplements. Don't use tobacco. Watch your alcohol consumption. Manage stress and get a, a, a regular physical examination to look for early indicators of disease that can be managed. So I would say that the nutritional components is is uh, a very synergistic factor for your patients who are doing aerobic activity. They should be aware of the lean mass plus shake from Adiva can help to maintain their lean mass. Strengthen their means that they're 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 uh, increase their lean mass if they're doing strength training, and the whey protein also helps us to support immune system function, as you likely know. The all-in-one Adiva multiple vitamin, those antioxidants not only quench free radicals but they support immune system function. And then you have after age fifty, immuno detox prime. That's at a point when your immune system starts to get winced. The thymus gland has undergone involution. You need to support your immune system in other ways. And so the ingredients in Immunity Detox Prime do that. So this is something I've done uh, since I was 45 or 50 years old. I've talked to you earlier about the fact that after age 40, your body stops making optimal amounts of glucosamine. I think after age 40, everybody should take at least one glucosamine joint formula so they don't end up with cartilage erosion and, and arthritic changes as they get older. And of course, because your CoQ10 levels decline as you get older and you need that to generate aerobic energy in the mitochondria, I think people should take cardio essentials after the age of 45. So the Adiva All-in-One Multi, these are the, the nutrients that support immune system function and quench free radicals for aerobically training individuals. I think this is critically important, as Dr. Cooper points out. You shouldn't be doing aerobic activity unless you're going to get extra antioxidants into your system or you might be putting yourself at risk. And after age 50, it's reishi, mushroom extract, astragalus, milk thistle, indole 3 carbonyl. These things are supporting your immune system function at a whole new level and helping your liver also detoxify potentially damaging compounds that enter the body. So I think two caps of the day after the age of 50 makes a lot of sense. I have uh, previously recorded some other uh, synergistic webinars that you should be aware of. The, the, the comprehensive one on nutritional medicine and immunity. If you haven't seen that one, you should see it. There's the link. Uh, there's one that I have on the evidence, the research evidence to support the use of a high potency multiple vitamin. You should see that because it's not just about, you know, people who are doing aerobic activity. You'll see all the benefits of a high potency multivitamin in terms of the human research. And also the, the webinar on human research looking at nutritional medicine and cancer, cancer prevention, and also the adjunctive management of cancer. All the human clinical studies that have been done are all sort of reported there. So it's sort of synergistic to some of the things we spoke about in this webinar. At the end of the day, I personally am very grateful to Dr. Kenneth Cooper. Uh, I read his book uh, in the early 1970s and started doing aerobic training then. I continue to do it now, but he was the reason that I got into maintaining aerobic health. But his research really has changed the world. All those people that you see jogging up and down the street and around tracks and doing all that stuff, this was really the person that, that put it on the map in terms of what the benefits can be if you're willing to put that effort in. So I want to thank you for sitting in today. I greatly appreciate it.